everybody, my name is Ellery and I'm part of the students team here at Covenant. We are so glad that you decided to stop by our YouTube channel today. If you are new here, text the word new to the number on the screen and we would love to get to know you and send you a gift. And now let's jump into our teaching time. Thanks for joining us today. Well, it is so great to be with you on 4th of July weekend. My name is Joe Cox. Welcome. We're glad you're here. Uh, if you're joining us online, and, and usually on the holidays, we get an uptick. Uh, thank you for joining us. And wherever you are, we hope you're having a great time with family and friends. And to all of you, please, it's the 4th of July. Let's be safe and come back with the same number of fingers that we came in with today, okay? Especially if you like to play with things that go boom. All right. Well, like Jordan said in the video, we are into a new series called Getting to Israel. And if you weren't able to join us last week, or if you're new with us, I invite you to go onto our website because you are just one message away from being caught up. And as I talk about what we're going to talk about this week, it really helps you to see where we're coming from next week, because these messages do a beautiful job of layering on top of each other. And, and I hope you'll enjoy today's. In fact, when I was getting ready to put today's, today's message together, um, I got to a point toward the end where it was time to give it a title. And most of the time, that's an easy thing. I will tell you, in this story, I got to the end of, the, of, of getting ready, and all I could think was, you got to be kidding I mean, how can a story like this be in the Bible? And how can a story like this be a part of God's greater plan? I, I just kept saying, you got to be kidding. And so what I'm going to say to you today, our title is, I kid you not. This really is in the Bible. And in fact, you're going you're gonna to hear this story and you're either going to think, you know what, there is hope for me, <laughs> or you're going to say, there is hope for my family because there is... Um, there is something about the people and the families in Genesis that brokenness just seems to run through them like a scarlet thread. But I'll tell you what else it runs through them. Redemption. And not just redemption, but redemption that leads to God fulfilling His purpose through powerfully imperfect people. And I hope that that's, that's a part of what you discover uh, today. Today's story comes out of Genesis chapter 27, and it's more than 30 verses long, so I'm just going to encapsulate it, but I would encourage you this week to go back and reread Genesis 27, and my recommendation is I would look at the New Living Translation and read it like a story, because it's a pretty impressive story. In this story... Isaac is now an old man, and he's so old that he's pretty much bedridden. His eyesight has almost completely left him. Uh, I would suspect that his sense of taste has grown dull, um, and he would suspect that he is close to dying. In fact, he thinks he's so close to dying that he reaches out to his son Esau, and by the way, it's his favorite son. And we know better than to do that, but Isaac did. He reached out to Esau. And to know Esau, you can begin to see maybe the attraction that Isaac had to him. Because to say the least, Esau was a burly man. More specifically, Esau was a hairy man. And he was an outdoorsy guy. He was a little bit like, like Grizzly Adams meets Bear Grylls meets Ted Nugent and just encapsulates the spirit of the wild. I mean, he could go out, he could hunt, he could kill, he could prep, he could grill, okay? And Esau was that kind of a guy, and Isaac really loved him to the point where he probably idolized him. In fact, Isaac saw Esau one day being his legacy. And so he brings Esau into his room, and he says, Esau, if you will go out into the wilderness, hunt down some wild game, prepare it, cook it, and bring it to me, I 
will give you my blessing. And that's what he does. He heads right out of the room and starts hunting. Now, Rebecca overhears this deal that just went down between Isaac and Esau. And she begins to panic. You see, her favorite son was Jacob, which was Esau's twin. And she was convinced that Jacob should be getting the blessing. And so she was going to hatch a plan so that Jacob could intercept the blessing. And, and let me stop there for a second, because some people might say, well, so what's the big deal of a blessing? Well, last week we talked about how Jacob has successfully swindled um, Esau's birthright. And, and he did it with simply a bowl of soup. Well, the birthright is basically everything that the father already has. So if you had two sons, you would divide it up into thirds and you would give two-thirds to the older son because that would be his birthright and then the other third would go to the other son. But Jacob had managed to swindle that. But the blessing, the blessing represents everything that could be. Everything that God is getting ready to promise you. And so to, a birthright might mean you get a piece of the farm. A blessing means you could become the ruler of a nation. And so, the, so the blessing was a really big deal. So Rebecca brings him in and says, listen, Jacob, I've got a plan. And here's what we're going to do. And so she says, I need you to go out into the pen and kill two goats, bring me the meat, and I'm going to prepare a meal for your father, one that he really likes. And because his eyesight is so poor, you're going to bring that meal in and you're going to present yourself as Esau. And in presenting that meal, you will actually get the blessing. Now, if you think that's crazy, Watch where this goes. Because immediately, Jacob is sitting there going, no, no, we're not doing that. That's, that's, that's crazy. Listen, if I walk in there and my dad finds out that I'm trying to swindle him, he's not going to give me God's blessing. He's going to give me God's curse. And so Rebecca says, let that curse fall on me. So not, our, not only are they swindling dad, but she's saying, God, curse me. She's actually letting Jacob come between her and God. Well, it just keeps going downhill. And she said, I'll tell you what, we're going to wrap you, your arms, and around your neck with goat skin. So you're going to have that real thick, coarse hair, just like your brother Esau. And then we're going to wrap you in Esau's clothes. He'll never know. And so Jacob goes along with the plan, puts the goat skins on, he puts his brother's clothes on, he, takes, he picks up the meal, and he leaves his mom in the path of God's curse walks into the room, presents the meal to receive the blessing, and dad immediately throws a curveball at him. He goes, how did you find this food so quickly? Remember, he was trying to get in before Esau came back. And Jacob does something just absolutely unbelievable he doesn't just lie to his dad. If he just lied to his dad, he could have just said, well, the animal was in the path. It just happened to be right there, so I killed it. Now, he says this. He says, God put an animal in my path. So he doesn't just lie to God. He is now blaspheming 
God. He is saying that God said something that he, that did something that he never did. So we've got Jacob, who is now lying to his father, blaspheming God, mom standing in front of God's curse, and we still haven't gotten the blessing yet. Now, the father has learned over time, you don't take your kids at their word anymore. They're just not trustworthy. And so he reaches out, and he begins to feel Jacob's arm. And what he feels is that goat fur. And he thinks, well, it feels like Esau, but your voice sounds like Jacob. And the meal, this tastes more like goat than it does wild game. So he's not convinced. It seems that, God, it seems that Isaac is on the fence still. And so then he does this. He, he, he says, come in close and kiss your father. I, I, I can't imagine the tension in this room at, the, at this point. And so Jacob's leaning in. And how nervous would you be knowing that your father's poor eyesight, now you're going to be basically face to face to him. And as he leans in, the father, instead of just kissing him, turns and goes, gives him a sniff test. And what does he smell? He smells the musky goat fur. He smells his brother's clothes. He smells like Esau. He feels like Esau. And at that point, he convinces Isaac that he is Esau. And so Esau gives him this beautiful blessing. And it is a blessing rich in, in wealth and in power and in promise. And as soon as Jacob gets Esau's blessing, he gets out of there. <laughs> That's all he came for. And so he is out the door. He is out the house. And within minutes... Here comes Esau. Now, Esau has brought food that he has prepared. And he brings it into the room, ready to receive the blessing. And I'm going to have to stop here because the story could go on and on. But what I want to leave it with is this. When he finds out that for a second time, Jacob has swindled him. Well, let's just say the food gets cool, but Esau heats up, and now he is red hot. Let's stop there. Let's, let's just try to freeze frame that image if we could for a second. Because of these four characters that are in this story, one thing we can be sure of, something matters deeply to each of them. For Isaac... What mattered to him? That his legacy looked like Esau, the burly wild man, and the firstborn. For Esau, what mattered to him was the blessing. In fact, he forsook his birthright. He really didn't care what he came from. He was just interested in getting what he could have. So, what mattered to him was simply the blessing. Now, for Jacob, what mattered to him was the blessing to the point where he was willing to blaspheme God. In other words, the blessing became more important than the blesser. He was willing to lie to his dad. The blessing became more important than the one who was going to pass on the blessing. And for Rebecca, the only thing that mattered was Jacob, that her favorite would get the blessing. You see, each person in this story, something mattered to them. But in that is what I call our starting idea. Fill this in if you would. When one thing becomes the only thing, and that thing 
is not God, it's idolatry. Now, I know that some people, when they hear the idea of idolatry, they think about going up to some, some strange shrine or, or bowing in front of some kind of statue or something. But idolatry is so much more subtle. In fact, I would say the majority of sins that we commit today usually involve some form of idolatry. And in each of those four characters that we just talked about, there was something that began to matter more than God. But of the four people that are interesting, I, I want to take a moment and I want to zoom in on Rebecca. Because Rebecca was carrying some additional information that most likely of the four, she was the only one that had this information. Her pregnancy with Esau and Jacob was anything but ideal. As soon as they were able to start moving inside of her womb, they started to fight. And the bigger they got, the harder they fought. You could look at her stomach, and it looked like there was a fight going on in there. They would fight during the second trimester. They would fight during the third trimester. In fact, they fought all the way out the birth canal. And while all this is going on inside of Rebecca, she's getting really concerned. And so God gave her a word. When you look at Genesis 25, verse, starting with verse 23, this is what it says. And the Lord told her, the sons in your womb will become two nations. <laughs> you don't say, it feels like I've got two nations inside of me right now. No, no, no. From the very beginning, the two nations will be rivals. And I'm sure at this point, Rebecca's going, check, they are rivaling. One nation will be stronger than the other. But then what God says next is very unique. He says, your older son will serve your younger son. Traditionally, the younger son would normally serve the older son. This was a very specific word from God. It was a prophetic word from God. Man, I, I can, y'all, I can count the time on one hand when I can say I have heard a word from God. And when, if you ever get an audible word from God, it will stick with you the rest of your life. And Rebecca received that word. One day, Jacob will be the leader of Esau. So if Jacob's going to be the leader of Esau, why do we need to hatch a plan to convince Isaac to give the blessing to the right kid. I believe something happens inside of the human heart when we allow something or someone to come into our spirit and they become as important or more important than God. It begins to break down our faith. It begins to sort of rattle our trust in God. And so all of a sudden, we begin to believe, well, to make this thing happen, I'm going to have to intervene. I'm going to have to <laughs> help God as if God needs our help. And Rebecca, knowing this, decides, I need to help God. You see, when God's word becomes challenging to us, whether it's a, a new word that we discovered in the scriptures or one that we've treasured in our hearts for years, when that word begins to challenge us, our spirit will almost intuitively ask one, of, one or both of these questions. The first question is this, what is God's intention? And then the second question is, what is God's capacity? We don't say it out loud, but we have 
immediately begin to feel that tension in our hearts when we feel challenged by God's word. Let's start with God's intention. When we say what is God's intention, we're not talking about what is the sequential plan that God has mapped out. What we're really asking is a deeper question. Is God really good? I mean, he's using people like me. And he's, and, he's, and he's using people like my family. What kind of a God would, would run to those people? Is he even good? And, and he allows these things to happen. Would a good God allow these things to happen? Well, you have to understand that from God's perspective, the word good means so much more. Let's start with Genesis 1, verse 3. When God creates light, and this is, the, this is the creation sequence that we have, every time he creates something, he says it is good. So in Genesis 1-3, when God creates light, he creates it, and then he says, and it was good. Now, the word good, when God uses the word good, it's not some word that sits on a scale when you're trying to sell your car online, okay? You know how that is. It's like, what's the condition of your car? Hmm, well... Poor, fair, good, very good, new. Well, good to us a lot of times is somewheres on a spectrum. But to God, his idea of good doesn't even fit on a spectrum. You see, the, the Hebrew word for God in Genesis 1 is the, is the Hebrew word tobe. And Tob means good beyond our reason. So when God says that something is good, he's not just saying it's good for me. He's saying it's good for us. And he's not just saying it's good for our church. He's saying it's good for our, our town, our community. It's, it's, it's good for our kingdom. And so this idea of good is so much more than just what's good for me. And this idea of good is not just bound by time. You know, we'll say, well, that was good. It was good in the moment. But no, it's good now. And my wife hates it when I make up words, but she's but it's, it, it's, it's gooder down the road. And you can write that down. You know what Joe said, gooder. So it, it, it's gooder as time goes by. It's gooder all the way into eternity. It's a profound word. And that is the kind of goodness that we are talking about when we talk about the intention of God. God's intention is tobe. It's good but good beyond our ability to reason. Jesus ran, ran into this in Luke 18, starting with verse 18. There was this rich, wealthy ruler, and he was doing a lot of good things. And he, he saw Jesus was coming, and he wanted to either impress or find favor with Jesus. So he says, verse 18, a certain young ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And then Jesus goes right into the next question. He says, why do you call me good? Then Jesus says, no one is good except God alone. God's idea of good will always override our understanding of good. And when he looks at you and he looks at me, he doesn't just see the good in us in the moment that comes from being created in his image. He sees the good that he can do in the future. And so I would, I would leave you on this here. Do we believe that God's intention, and, and please misspell this, is good? All right? If you're from Eastern North Carolina, this will come easy to you. It's good. That would be a funner way than saying Tobe, right? It's, it's, it's not just good, it's good. Well, what about his capacity? You see, 
something began to, to fracture in Rebecca's faith when she heard Isaac promising something that wasn't supposed to happen. And God was not shaken by that, but she was. There was a competing force in her life with this love for Jacob. And so she began to wonder if God's capacity was diminishing. And, 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 that, and that's how so often the power of God's Word in our life gets overridden by our life experiences. It's, it's where people would say, you know what, I never thought I would have done what I just did. Or I never thought I would, I would do something that I know is wrong. But how does that happen? Usually, something else has come along like an idol. And it has taken first place in our lives. And in the human experience, we struggle with that. Sooner or later, when we come into God's Word and we read something, that our human experience is challenging us. And if there is something or someone in that human experience, it will tempt us to rattle our ability to think, does God really have this within his capacity? Jesus ran into this again, but this time he ran into it at the end of his ministry when he was in the garden. He was about to be arrested and put on trial. And Peter decided to intervene and override God's plan because it played out like this. As Jesus was being arrested, what does Peter do? He draws out his sword, takes a swipe at a Roman guard. Obviously, he's not very good because he misses everything but the side of his head, manages to lop off his ear. And at this point, Peter is about two seconds from becoming a human pincushion with all those Roman soldiers around him. But, P but Jesus jumps in and saves Peter's life and then teaches something that we need to hear today. He said, Peter, put your sword back in its place. Jesus said to him, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? You see, Jesus also had a word from the Lord that this was going to happen in a certain way, just like Rebecca did. And Peter started to panic and try to override that process. But Jesus said something really important here. He said, I have access to my father's angels, 12 legions. Now, if I had to give you a low ball number on what 12 legions looks like, the low number is 36,000 angels. That is a serious power right there. Because it only takes one angel to neutralize this situation. You just need one. What Jesus is saying is, Peter, I have not just enough. I have more than enough. My capacity is more than enough. One to 36,000, enough. That's God's word to us. That's his heart for us. That's his capacity to us. That our Father is trying to remind us each day, I am more than enough. Everything I have, I can do so much more than you can do on your own. When my son sacrifices his life on a cross for you, that's not just a one-for-one one deal. That's not just one life for one life. It's more than enough. That is one life that covers everyone, past, present, 
and future. Jesus and what He did on the cross is more than enough. And to live faithfully in this world today when it doesn't feel possible by the power of my Holy Spirit, it is. But my Holy Spirit isn't simply able to get you by in life. It is more than enough to live faithfully. So with this, the knowledge of the salvation of Jesus Christ and the power of, his, of God's Word and the working of the Holy Spirit in our lives, God's capacity in us is more than enough. So let me ask you, do we believe that God's capacity is more than enough? And it, I'm not picking on Rebecca. Because I would suspect by time Jacob and Esau are fully grown, she is growing weary. She's tired of the infighting between these brothers. She's, she's been caught up with this tension point with her husband where she favors Jacob. He favors Esau. She has this promise from God that's in her heart and it's never looking like it's going to be fulfilled to the point where probably God is losing ground. And all of us, sooner or later, our spirits do become tired. We do become weary. I hear that. And I feel that. Um, I, when, I was, when I was hanging out with, with, with college students over, over the last few years, I would see college students grow tired because they're, they're in school, they're trying to be faithful to God in, in a college culture, they're having to hold a job, they're, they're accumulating debt, and all they're trying to do is get to that next part of God's plan in their life. And I can't tell you how many times I heard the phrase, I just want to give up. I just want to short circuit the process, quit and go home. I, I, I see this in people today when, when they're single. And they want to feel the deepness and the, the power of intimate love. And they're getting tired of being single to the point where maybe I'm just going to short circuit the process and, and settle for something because something's better than nothing, right? We grow weary after a while. Maybe you feel that way right now in your marriage. That somewhere along the way, this marriage got off its tracks and you're wondering if it will ever get back on. And you're really tempted at some point to just walk away. Or maybe even in your own family. You, you feel like your family has turned into a three-ring circus and, and just when you think you're getting this area under control, this blows apart, and then you're over here trying to manage that, and then this over here, and, and you're sitting there wondering, God can use our family? I don't even think God has an idea of what's going on in our family. He does. And His good intention and His more than enough capacity is crying out to us, keep going. I'm not done yet. And so... When you wake up tomorrow and you open up God's Word, you have two truths in your heart that you cannot change. One is this. My Father's capacity is so much more than enough. It's not over. It's not over. And my Father's goodness is not just something that we, that we mumble about in church sometimes. My, my Father's goodness extends beyond human reasoning. That is our God. May I pray for you? So Lord... As we are in the midst of this study on the life of Jacob, Lord, we do not 
read this story in a vacuum, Lord. We, we come into this story and we bring our story alongside of it. And so my prayer for myself and for my brothers and my sisters, would you whisper into the deepest part of our soul, I've got this. It's not over. If you're weary, lean into me. Stay to my word. Stay faithful to my word. Trust my word. My word I give to you. And it's good. It's not just good in the moment. It's good for the future. It's good for eternity. And it's not just good for you. It's good for us. But Lord, I pray that your spirit would say that in us in a way that compels our spirit. And Lord, I want to pray for anyone, Lord, that as they began to understand what an idol is, they began to realize they have an idol. It might be something, it might be a person, but it's an idol. And it stands between them and you. And it has become more important than you. Lord, I pray, Father, that you would compel anyone who has brought an idol in their hearts, Lord, that as we prepare for communion, that they would get up from the altar of that idol and that they would come to this altar and leave their idol, that they would leave their idol here. Whatever they love more than you, Lord, would be left here. And that as they rise, that they would rise in freedom, that when they stand, they would stand, they would feel lighter and that their love for you would be renewed and more importantly, that your love for them would become alive in their hearts like never before. That when they approach the bread and the juice, Lord, it means so much more. For Lord, you are more than enough. And as this song reminds us over and over, you are good. We thank you for that. And we pray this in Jesus' name, for your glory, God. Amen.